Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for this on device research brand advertisers guide to digital ad effects in this webinar. Um, today, I will be talking you through some of the key learnings from the report, which is available on the on device uh, website. Um, if you haven't downloaded it already, it's available on deviceresearch.com. Just click on the blog pages and you'll find it there for your, um, your viewing pleasure. My name is Ian Gibbs. I am a uh, marketing and data consultant on device research. And I'm just going to spend the next half hour, uh, next 35 minutes, walking you through some of the key learnings from our report. Um, essentially covering off you know, how we should be measuring and optimizing brand in the digital space how we should be moving beyond simple behavioral metrics um, of digital effectiveness and employing market-leading research solutions to, to measure brand impact. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of this webinar, um, but if you don't want to ask me a question in this forum, I'll also be leaving my email address. So look, please do get in touch if, uh, if you have any direct um, questions about this presentation or indeed if it um, prompts any other further thinking around digital measurement in the brand space. But to get started, a nice quote from David Wilding from Twitter, founding director of Twitter UK. Last year, in May, he said the blinkers helped the wearer remain focused on what is immediately in front, reduces distraction and prevents the wearer from being spooked. They're mainly worn by horses, marketeers, and media planners. Now, for me, I think this nicely sums up an issue which very much pervades the digital ad industry. It's always pervades the digital ad industry and arguably is only getting worse. And that's a real short-termism. It's a real short-termism in terms of how we measure the impact of digital. A lot of us are guilty on measuring just short-term uh, metrics of success, measuring the impact of digital in terms of what's immediately in front of us rather than the long-term. And often that short-term measurement involves using very simple behavioral metrics, metrics of success, click-through rates and page views. Metrics which tell us nothing about um, the long-term benefit that digital can bring to brands, both in terms of, I suppose, branding effect and also harder sales and ROI metrics. So today is very much about exploring, um, you know, the methodologies and data processes and measurement solutions that we can bring to bear um, on the, the measurement, optimization, and iteration of um, brand campaigns online. These are our top 10 learnings. I'm not going to go through them all now on this slide because we're going to cover, uh, cover them all through the rest of the presentation. But this is broadly what we'll be covering today. But by way of introduction, I think it's really worth focusing on why we should be um, talking about measurement at all. Um, measure, research has proven that ad budgets weighted towards long-term brand building drive inverted commas very large business benefits. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware of this piece of research. It comes from the IPA, their long and short bit white paper, uh, released a few years ago now. It's essentially a meta-analysis of the IPA's data bank. So, of course, um, their data bank being um, a, a large database of lots of campaigns which have been submitted to their effectiveness awards. And, of course, the IPA is the UK's media um, you know, industry body for, for, for media agencies, and, um, you know, agencies of all shapes and sizes. Um, and essentially, an analysis of this data bank revealed that brands which, on average, devote approximately 60% of their budget towards long-term brand building and marketing goals, and 40% of their budget towards short-term um, response or sales-oriented goals, tend to drive the largest business benefits. And these benefits can include a number of things, so um, shareholder value, uh, market share increases, uh, price, inelastic, uh, price inelasticity, brand equity growth, etc. Um, but it tends to be that those who focus on 60% of their budget on building brands over time, as the CMO of L'Oreal puts it, and 40% on building sales overnight, those are, those are the brands which really drive the largest business benefit. But this isn't a proportion, this isn't a model that we seem to apply to our measurement of digital. So in the digital space, when we asked, so when, when Walk and the Mobile Marketing Association last year asked people what metrics they use to measure mobile marketing effectiveness, the majority, most commonly, were using engagement metrics and behavioral metrics. So about 65, about two-thirds of us are using engagement metrics and behavioral metrics. 
things like video complete and very simple binary metrics like click through rates. If you consider that only about one in a thousand people actually click on online ads, you have to ask yourself to what extent a measurement like click through rates really tells you about long term brand effectiveness. Now, considering that 60% of our budget should be wasted towards brand, it therefore seems un it, it therefore seems strange that only 22% of us would use brand metrics um, to actually measure the effectiveness, um, in this case, of mobile marketing. And in fact, less than half of us, 45%, are using business metrics such as ROI. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, how we best measure the effectiveness of campaigns, creators and channels to help improve the ROI of brand spend. How can we move beyond simple behavioral metrics like click-through rates and really focus on long-term brand value and metrics which really tell us something about tangible business outcomes? Well, a good starting point is to develop and stick to, I suppose, implement a framework to measure and improve your, um, your brand spend. At On Device Research, one of the framework which we increasingly and talk about when, we, uh, when we're trying to encapsulate, I suppose, the entire funnel, the entire sort of um, gambit of digital measurement and branding. We talk about return on brand impact. Um, and you know, for us, this, sits, this can sit at the heart of campaign planning and evaluation. And that broadly, there are three inputs which feed into return on brand impact. One of those is your campaign spend, spend data, you know, your buy details. One of them is your campaign reach data, who you reached, how many of them within your target audience. And then crucially, update data. So this is uh, derived from brand, brand studies, which look at uplift um, throughout the purchase funnel from awareness to purchase intent. Looking at these three inputs, you can calculate your um, return on brand impact. And we'll look at this in more detail in the next slide, but essentially, um, by understanding the cost per incremental purchase in tender, so that is the cost that it takes to make one additional person say they are likely to purchase your brand or purchase from your product, and comparing this across your media partners, creative formats, and different frequencies, we can enhance your return on brand impact. We can enhance return, um, ROI. So having this framework is, is a crucial starting point for, for moving away from very simple behavioral metrics of success. Now, just to take you through a working example, um, there's a lot of numbers on this slide, so just bear with me. What we'll do is we'll work through the top half of it from left to right. In this example, we have a campaign, which is a budget of £30,000. Um, we have run a brand effectiveness test on it, which has shown that this study has driven increase in purchase intent of 20 percentage points. So 55% of people in the control group said so they were likely to purchase the brand. 75% of people in the exposed group, those who had seen the ad, said they were likely to purchase in brand, which makes, make, means that we have an additional 20 people per 100 saying that they are likely to make a purchase um, of the, from the brand or of a product. Now, through our campaign tracking, we also know that the campaign, campaign reached 400,000 individuals. So if we multiply this 400,000, this reach of 400,000, by our purchase intent uplift of 20%, we know that of that 400,000, 80,000 of, of these people were incremental purchase intenders. Following campaign exposure, there were 80,000 new individuals who said they were likely to make a purchase from the brand. So moving on to the right-hand side of this slide now, we can now calculate the cost per incremental purchase intender. So this is the cost that it makes it takes to make one additional person so they're likely to purchase from your brand or purchase on your product. And this is calculated by taking a campaign budget of £30,000 and dividing it by our 80,000 incremental purchase intenders to have a cost per incremental purchase intender of 38 pence. We can then make an assumption about what a purchase intender is going to do. In this case, we've just said that they are going to buy one unit of, say, one jar of, you know, or one box of tea or one jar of mayonnaise for £1.50, for example, you know, you can apply your own assumptions here. And if we then take, um, take that cost, take that value, divided by the cost, so £1.50 divided by 38 pence, we end up with a return on brand impact of £4. So that means that for every £1 of digital brand spend, 
a potential of four pounds of sales is generated. Now the crucial word here is potential. So unlike an ROI calculation, which looks at actual sales, we are looking at stated purchase intent. Of course, not absolutely everyone who says that they're gonna purchase your brand in a survey will, but there is a very strong correlation between purchase intent and stated purchase activity. There's lots of academia to support that, and of course that is why we measure purchase intent in the first place. But by looking at this potential, we at least get a sense of the scale, the ceiling of success that we can expect from brand spend. So that's the return on brand impact. For every one pound of digital brand spend, a potential of four pound sales is generated. And you know, through our work, we conducted some work recently. We have, um, on device research, we have a, a, a normative database of over 350 digital campaigns, which allow us to look at the average performance of campaigns across different categories. And actually, we've looked at the top 10 performing FMCG campaigns um, going back to halfway through last year. And we found that on average, the top 10 are driving a, a return on brand impact of £4.28. So taking an average unit price of £5.91, dividing it by a cost per incremental purchase in tender of £1.38, we get an average return on brand impact of £4.28. And again, this is a, a methodology which is extremely easy to apply to your brand surveys. And it's a, it's a framework by which brand effectiveness can be optimized and iterated going forward. But once you've established a framework, I guess the question is, what does success look like? You know, how do we set ourselves benchmarks? How do we set ourselves KPIs for, for brand spend? If we're not going to focus on things like click-through rates, and we are going to focus on what matters, how do we set benchmarks? And again, this very much, well, it's interesting, there was a Deloitte survey from last year. Um, it was a survey of um, about a few hundred chief marketing officers. Um, they reported that um, over the last 12 months, that in general, um, brand value had increased by, um, had increased by 3.8%, and customer acquisition by 3.1%. But it does break the question in the digital space, you know, how are we measuring brand value? What are the metrics that we're using to um, and assess such an improvement? And furthermore, how can you benchmark digital marketing specifically in your industry? I think, you know, the answer is, is that the brand metrics that we use, should use to measure, measure success in the digital space are exactly the same metrics that we should be using in the offline space. I'm sure it comes as no, no surprise to many of you these are very familiar metrics. We're talking about metrics like unprompted brand awareness, top of mind brand awareness. Does your brand come to mind before, for, for consumers before that for competitors? Ad recall, um, are your ads cutting through? Are people explicitly remembering them? And then as you move further down the branding funnel, how are we impacting brand consideration and purchase intent? Now, the figures that we're showing on this chart here, these are Delta shifts, these are the percentage point difference between control and exposed groups. So the control groups being people who haven't seen a campaign and the exposed groups being people who have seen your digital activity. So for example, an uplift of 12.2% in an unprompted brand awareness means that following campaign exposure, an additional 12.2 um, people per 100 were able to um, recall your brand. It's per purchase intent, an additional three people per hundred say they like to make a purchase from your brand. So that's what we're looking at here when we're looking at these Delta improvements. What's particularly important is that you obviously take your industry, uh, uh, you know, your product categories into account. Um, you know, the effectiveness of digital, although a brand building platform demonstrably across all categories, it does perform differently in different areas of branding funnel for different categories. Um, I've just shown an example here of unprompted brand awareness split out of the top five categories, but we've got this data, of course, for all the different metrics. Um, um, FMCG tends to um, you know, be the highest perform in terms of unprompted brand awareness. Travel, 7.8% uh, um, you know, um, shift on average. The point is, is that depending on your category, depending on whether there are a lot of new product launches, whether it's a high consideration or low consideration, whether it's a category where consumers tend to have a high product or low product repertoire, you will see very different um, brand metric results. So it's really important to take this into account when setting benchmarks. And you know, all this should be done in the context of setting smart objectives, which I'm sure 
is, you know, an acronym you're very familiar with in the business sphere. You know, obviously, any KPI setting um, should look to set specific, measurable, um, attainable, realistic, and time-based objectives. And that should be just as applicable to your brand spend as it should be to anywhere else in your business. So once we've established a framework for measuring branding and once we've established you know, how we should set our benchmarks, of course we need to look at what levers we can pull um, to, I suppose, optimize um, brand campaign delivery. You know, what, what, what levers are there? What elements of a campaign will help us not just optimize current campaign spend, but create learnings which um, feature um, and factor into future strategic plans and help us optimize um, campaign spend on a, a long-term basis. One of those considerations will be platform, of course. Um, you know, the cross-platform reality is very much, um, you know, part of I suppose the digital ecosystem at the moment. Um, has been for a number of years. Global Web Index suggests that we access digital content on 3.2 devices per consumer per day. I'm sure those of you on the webinar are probably above this average. Um, you know, and I think that's probably the reason why this Forrester and Facebook survey from last year revealed that for 84% of marketers, you know, cross-platform cross strategies have since been crucial to their success. And unsurprisingly, accuracy is rated as the critical consideration when it comes to measuring success in a cross-platform world. And accuracy, you know, is a real issue. There are plenty of web analytics platforms out there, for example. Um, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion around cross-platform metrics. Some web analytics systems will, um, will simply measure browsers rather than users. For example, if I was to access a particular website on my phone, and then my iPad, and then my work machine, and then, my, then perhaps my laptop at home, um, many systems would measure me as four separate individuals. But of course, it's not. I'm one individual accessing on four separate browsers. So, you know, Getting a user-centric rather than browser-centric uh, sense of cross-device um, usage and cross-device ad exposure, crucially, um, is actually essential for campaign measurement. And as you can see here, this diagram at the top left um, demonstrates what we're trying to do here, creating a user-centric view of ad exposure. And on device research, you know, for us, this is about embedding one by one pixel tags into mobile and desktop and app creative. Um, ad creative and matching exposed, so people exposed to creative, um, matching exposed panelist IDs to our de device ID panel. So this means that we could get to build up a really rich picture of exactly who has been exposed to what ads on which devices. And this, we can therefore um, assess the merits of different platforms accordingly. Um, top right of this slide, we've just shown, for example, um, but on average, people exposed on multiple devices tend to record larger uplifts in awareness than those exposed on just single devices. Um, and again, we have this data broken out by individual platforms. Um, you know, there are numerous ways in which marketers take advantage of cross-device to catch sequential creative messaging, the use of responsive cross-device ad format, to scale up or down depending on your screen size. You know, these are all used to target consumers with an always on mindset. Um, DSPs, media owners, these are another crucial lever that can be pulled where, um, to optimize the um, success of brand campaigns in the digital space. Um, a survey from IDCOMS last year revealed that a lot of um, advertisers feel that they're struggling to keep up with the rapid ev evolution in the tech landscape, uh, making them very dependent on their agency to provide them with their solutions. Um, you know, I think some of you might be familiar with the Lumascape chart, that chart which has thousands of tiny logos which try to explain the confusion of the ad tech space, um, the number of businesses that sit between consumers and advertisers they try to get their, um, their marketing message um, towards, you know, consumer eyeballs. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of those logos are represented by DSPs, demand side platforms, people who are obviously aggregating um, inventory in the programmatic um, landscape and you know looking at how you know looking at how we can independently um, assess the impact of DSPs and individual digital media owners is crucial um, for assessing how we define success. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we you know through the studies that we've conducted on device research, there's been about 300, well, there's more than 350 of them now. 
we can start to aggregate different types of media, media owners and DSPs. And it's very clear that there's no one size fits all to media owner and DSP selection. A, a wide range of innovative targeting techniques and tech um, is at the disposal of advertisers. Here we just looked in the top right um, at some brand metric improvements for ad recall and brand considerations, so some upper funnel and lower funnel metrics. And for, um, for one of these, we've just split it out by geo DSPs, so DSPs which are specifically using geolocation data to target advertising, and the other one is for video DSPs. Um, video DSPs, because of the formats they're deploying, you know, very uh, engaging, eye-catching formats. They're, still, they're, recording, they're recording large uplifts in terms of ad recall. They're very noticeable ad formats. The geolocation DSPs, on the other hand, they tend to work harder at the bottom end of the branding funnel. Um, by targeting consumers who are, are at a sort of known um, brand consideration or purchase intent mindset because of where they are, a bit, you know, they might have been near a physical retail store location, they're driving better metric shifts at the bottom end of the branding funnel. So clearly, depending on your objectives, different DSPs are going to drive um, um, different metrics for success. Um, it's also quite important not just to look at brand uplift, but to look at the overlap between the audience delivered as well. So in the example at the bottom of this slide, DSP1 is delivering the majority of the audience, um, 1.2 million individuals on average, seeing 6.9 times on average um, compared to DSP2. There's a minimal overlap. Why this is important is because, of course, if you're trying to maximize reach, you want minimal overlap. If you're really trying to build frequency, you might want quite a strong overlap. It's just, but also, you want to look at the efficiency with which you're buying your campaign as well. Um, it may be that you don't want to buy a duplicate audience from competing DSPs. You want to find new and unique audiences. So independent verification campaign delivery in this way is essential. Now, leading on from that, another lever you can pull, of course, is campaign frequency. Um, and very much linked to the previous point, the measurement of frequency in the digital space has increasingly become quite, um, it's become increasingly, it's been quite a challenge. I think, you know, a, a, one of the main reasons is there is often a disconnect in reporting between disparate DSPs, between um, competing pieces of ad tech kit. Um, similarly, cross-device attribution, different devices building up a picture of how frequency looks um, for known individuals across different devices can be a challenge, especially when you consider that people do delete their cookies. If cookies are being used to record and store information about frequency, once it gets deleted, that frequency count gets um, deleted. And that's why, you know, there's this quote here from Bill Staples from Group M saying, you know, one challenge is we see clients sometimes use multiple DSPs, or have a bunch of disparate I.O. by hitting the market. Um, it's not uncommon for, therefore, for DSPs to go head-to-head -to -head with each other, yet we don't always have the measurement solutions in place, um, which ensure that um, campaign frequency can be accurately measured across all digital touch points. And again, you know, for us, it just comes down um, you know, to tagging our campaign create, to tagging your campaign creative um, with our pixel tags and visualizing campaign exposure across our, our, our panels of consumers to ensure we're building a full picture of frequency. In this example, uh, we've just measured two DSPs. As you can see, they've both delivered a similar number of impressions, 1.5, 1.6 million. Um, DSP1 has actually had a higher reach, a lower frequency, so reaching nearly 360,000 individuals, 4.3 times on average. Whereas DSP2 has grew, uh, reached about 247,000 individuals, 6.6 .6 times on average. Now, normally this wouldn't matter so much, but actually both of them have recorded a very similar um, uh, performance in terms of how they've driven people to to physical store locations. So we'll talk about this solution later on, but uh, on device, we're not just measuring brand impact. We have solutions using geolocation data where we can measure whether people have actually visited bricks and mortar retail store locations. Now, because DSP2 has recorded the same performance as DSP1, uh, but delivered a lower audience reach and a higher frequency, DSP1 has actually proven to be far more efficient in terms of the cost per incremental visitor delivered. So again, it's just one of those key considerations that need to be taken into account as we assess how we optimize 
current and future campaign delivery. Creativity, you know, um, creative executions are obviously a massive part of how important um, uh, campaign performance um, um, actually stacks up in the end. I mean, something that, you know, not everyone in the supply chain obviously has impact over, but it's important nonetheless. You know, it's interesting to note that marketers and advertisers are actually very confident in their ability to target consumers with the right messaging. However, we know through our ad impact database that actually the top 20% of mobile campaigns are actually outperforming the remaining 80% more than six times over in terms of ad recall. The top quintile of ad performing mobile campaigns are actually cutting through way more than the rest of the pack. And what we've been able to do um, is have a look at the commonalities between them. Some independent research as well from um, uh, Nielsen Catalina Solutions um, suggest that 40% um, of, um, of, of all sales lift um, is contributed to by creative. Creative has a, has a huge impact on campaign performance. So I guess the question is, you know, what can you do to ensure that your digital ads are conforming to creative best practice? So we performed a meta-analysis on a database to look at the commonalities, the creative commonalities between that top 20%. Um, again, this is available, free to download, on the ondeviceresearch.com blog. Um, it's a creative best practice guidelines. And there are 10 key guidelines there. Some of them may sound blindingly obvious to you, but it's amazing how many people aren't conforming to the, these top 10. We tend to find that on average, the, the most memorable campaigns, the best performing campaigns, conform to at least six out of 10 of these best practices. So we can see here in the left-hand chart, for example, the top 20% of campaigns, 91% of them, um, contain some sort of product shot in their, um, in their creative. Bottom 20%, only 61% do. It's amazing how many ads don't actually contain a product shot when they're trying to tell you, sell you something. Similarly, for those ads that are trying to drive purchase intent, unsurprisingly, 84% of the top performers actually contain some sort of tangible, clear call to action. Only 53% of those in the bottom, um, bottom 20% do. So, you know, it's really important. I mean, here are the top 10. I won't go through them in detail. As I said, some of them may seem blinding love this, but it's amazing how many people don't stick to it. Omnipresent logos, human presence, video ads, the use of humor. Um, the list is there for you to take a look at and, and to, to check off when you're, um, you know, when you're assessing campaign performance. Now, this whole idea of real-time optimization, uh, optimization is really important. I think, you know, we talked earlier on, and again, just a reminder on this chart, you know, a lot of people in the industry are still using behavioral metrics like click-through rates, page impressions to measure the impact of digital activity. But um, it's a very binary um, behavioral metric which tells us nothing about how people think or feel about brands and tells us nothing about long-term impact. Why do we do it? Well, this, I think the simple reason is because it's easy to do. It's very easy to pull off an ad server report in near real time and get lots of information about click-through rates from a plethora of different formats and media owners. The question is therefore, how can we optimize campaign delivery using brand metrics? Um, you know, most marketeers, according to a Kantar survey, um, you know, most marketers agree that campaign optimization strategy should be considered in the pre-launch phase of the campaign. However, that's an ideal. 39% are actually don't uh, don't actually think about optimization until after a campaign has gone live. So, what can we do to optimize campaign in 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 real time? Well, um, at on device we have a solution which allows us to assess um, campaign performance, almost predict campaign performance. Um, in a live environment in the first few days, essentially the first week of a campaign. It allows us to take a quick read on campaign performance, brand impact by creative, and then optimize the rest of the campaign towards the most successful creative. So in this, um, in this kind of dummy example, there are two creatives being tested in the first week of the campaign, an equal weighting of impressions, one and a half million impressions each, both of them are reaching 500,000 individuals through our known campaign tracking at a frequency of three times. 
Um, the budget is 30,000, so divided equally between the two, 15,000 each. And we know from our live um, in-market brand survey, the Creative One has resulted in a purchase intent uplift of 8 percentage points, but Creative Two has resulted in a purchase intent uplift of 70 percentage points. Multiplying this purchase intent uplift by our unique reach, so that 8 percent times 500,000, we can find out how many per uh, incremental purchase intenders we have and subsequently divide that number by a budget to figure out a cost per incremental purchase intender. Again, the cost it takes to make one in, in extra individual so they're likely to purchase your brand. Now clearly here, Creative 2 has been far more efficient with a cost per incremental purchase intender of 18 pence as opposed to 38 pence. If we were to then optimize the rest of the campaign towards Creative 2, we would end up with 45,000 additional incremental purchase intenders, which is a 36% up um, increase. So again, you know, I think people think you cannot optimize by brand metrics. It's absolutely not the case. There are solutions in the market which allow you to move away from basic behavioral metrics and really tell you something of tangible um, relevance about brand impact. Moving on to audience verification. Um, so I think you know it's no secret that ad fraud is a huge issue in the digital ad space. Um, it amounts to an estimated 16.4 billion globally. Apparently, that 20 uh, percent of all digital ad spend is wasted. Numerous ways people have been defrauded digitally. There's click fraud. There's um, you know, ad stacking on pages. There's domain spoofing. But ultimately, what this means is that campaign efficiency is being impacted dramatically. And not just campaign uh, you know, efficiency, but brand safety as well. You know, we can be unsure about where our ads often end up, um, given, given that 20% might end up in fraudulent locations. You know, it tends to be this trusted media brand survey from last year revealed that you know, people felt that working with, um, working with trusted brand safe environments is the way to ensure audience quality. And I think for that reason, we have to ask ourselves, how can we verify audience quality if audience quality is the route to, um, I suppose, mitigating against um, ad fraud? Again, for us on device, it's about embedding our, you know, our pixel tags into campaign creative and visualizing who has been exposed to campaigns um, and you know, stacking this up against our known demographic data about panelists. Um, in this example, a campaign aimed at men, we can see here on the left-hand side that DSP2 was delivering a far greater efficiency in terms of men reach um, versus DSP1. Um, again, it allows advertisers, gives them the confidence to have conversations with their partners, their media owners, with their DSPs about how they should be delivering their campaign and the effectiveness of targeting. Uh, particularly when you stack up this kind of demographic picture against platforms that are being used. So for example, adults age 25 plus here, we've shown where they're most likely to overlap in terms of different platforms. The biggest overlap between being between um, well, what we've said here is mobile, mobile web and uh, desktop. Again, it allows you to come up with informed decisions about where your campaign is and isn't delivering and where I suppose you can then be assured that you're going to re re receive sort of the brand impact that you want within the target audience that, that, that you have bought against. Um, moving on from that, I think another concern in the industry, and it's just a, a word that we hear banded around a lot, is this idea of wall gardens. The social media um, ad spend, I mean, a, a CMO survey, the same Deloitte CMO survey we referenced earlier on, suggests that about 10.5% of marketing budgets is being devoted towards social media at the moment. And this is set to almost double in the next five years to 18.5%. Um, you know, for many, I mean, this term around the duopoly of Google and Facebook, I mean, they alone account for 55% of digital ad spend. I mean, that's in the UK. It's a far greater figure in the US and elsewhere. But there are these concerns around data transparency and insight being hidden behind walled gardens. Admittedly, both companies are moving towards uh, more transparency and accreditation, but you know they haven't necessarily achieved the levels of the rest of the market. And you have to therefore ask yourself, what, what is it that you can do to ensure that you're getting a true and independent read 
on the brand performance of your campaign, when you're running a social media campaign, behind a wall garden? You know, and how do these perhaps um, work in conjunction with the sort of standard um, action-based metrics that get reported on by social platforms? Things like likes and views, for example. Well, there's quite a simple solution, really, um, and that involves um, using ad insertion technology. So we can recreate a live lab environment, essentially, uh, sorry, live environment, and we can insert your brand ads into consumers' news feeds, into their Facebook or their Instagram or their YouTube feeds. Um, and what's particularly exciting is we can then run a brand effectiveness test, so again, testing those measures like awareness and ad recall, purchase intent, and we can stack these up against um, behavioral metrics. So here, for example, the chart at the top, we've shown that between control and expose, there's been a, there's been a sizable uplift in unprompted brand awareness following exposure on the social platform. The largest shift has been delivered by those who um, have seen the ad for three or more seconds, perhaps unsurprisingly. Splitting this out by creative, though, we can actually see the creative A in the table below. Um, has a larger um, score for ad visibility, so in other words, people looked at it for longer. Um, sorry, a larger proportion of people looked at the ad, and they looked at it for longer with you know higher visibility duration. Creative B actually uh, scored lower for these metrics, but d drove a larger shift in unprompted awareness. The creative elements of Creative B were so strong that despite lower viewability rates, it actually drove a larger brand metric up there. Again, really useful, useful metrics for assessing um, impact of the campaign behind wall gardens and creating future um, learnings um, to optimize digital activity. Now the final point we wanted to make was just this idea about full location data. You know, ROI is a top concern for digital decision makers. Nearly a third rank it is their number one concern for buying digital media. But there are considerable perceived challenges around uh, measuring ROI, and not least, it's linking actual sales data, or at the very least, actual in-store activity um, to digital um, ad exposure. Um, earlier on, we talked about using purchase intent um, as a key metric of success. But for those brands which have bricks and mortar locations, they have retail stores, we can actually go one step further and measure whether someone has visited a known location. We actually partner with a company called Location Science to do this. Um, so they have a, a, a large data set of known um, um, consumer activity in relation to geolocation um, uh, coordinates. Um, and actually, um, you know, this is a type of insight that you can derive here. So before a campaign, we have our control group in the dark green cells, Exposed, um, sorry, exposed group of the dark green cells, your control group in the light green. And as you can see, they've been balanced, matched before campaign, um, before campaign activity to make sure they can fair light for light comparison. During the campaign, there's been an uplift in in-store visits. There's even been a small uplift following the campaign in the post-campaign period, which results in an uplift of 2.2% overall. And again, you know, we can factor these into ROI calculations to bring a new level of accuracy for those with bricks and mortar retail locations looking at actual in-store visits. So look, back to the end of our ten, um, our, our uh, you know, our ten key learnings. I think for us, you know, just to summarise, it's very much around, um, you know, we do recommend the brand advertisers need to send, you know, set, set benchmarks which take into account their brand category and wrap this up into a true framework for measuring and improving their brand spend. And that is that's an, a, a framework that we refer to as return on brand impact. The levers that you can pull to improve return on brand impact and reduce your cost per incremental purchase and tender are around devices, media partners, DSPs, frequency, creative and format. And by optimizing these using real-time solutions and by optimizing them um, using solutions which allowed us to peer behind wall gardens, you know, we can understand how all of these the levers that we can pull to optimize brand spend and how these different platforms and elements fit in the overall digital um, mix. And then of course, as we've just seen, the retailers and brands of physical locations, we can take this one step further and assess the impact on physical store activity. You know, we recommend 
um, you know, quarterly assessment of um, campaign activity and developing scorecards. So, for example, here in Q1, we saw that the, the biggest impact on purchase intent was driven by DSP4 at a frequency of 3 plus and an ad unit A and on mobile web. And here, the, and as you can see, the Delta scores, the uplifts that recorded in purchase intent, which were driven by each of these elements, become our benchmarks for the, the next quarter. These become our smart KPIs for next quarter, um, against which we should aspire and try and improve and improve. So this kind of scorecard approach is the way in which we optimize and iterate future activity. So again, here's just a summary of our top 10. If you haven't seen this report already, I do encourage you um, to go to the on-device research website and, um, and download it. But for now, that's it from me. I don't know if we have any immediate questions now. Um, if not, here is my email address. Um, please do email me with any questions that you have around anything you've heard of today or any ideas it may have prompted. Any questions? Okay, well look, thanks very much for your time for um, everyone. Um, as I said, we'll be, I'll circulate this deck um, after this presentation as well. It is available on our website. But um, I do hope we hear um, from you very soon. Thank you very much.